Welcome to the Leaders Mindset, where we bring you illuminating conversations with leaders who are making an impact in business and our communities. Thanks for sticking with us, and thanks for tuning in again today. Today, our guest is Nick Mott. He's the founder of 7-5 Media, he's a documentary filmmaker, and he's also an Army veteran. He's just had his latest film get released, and that's where we're going to start. So welcome to the show, Nick. Thank hey, you for Jason, being with thanks. us today. Tell us all about your new film and where the audience can see it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me on here for sure and, and letting your uh, followers hopefully enjoy this amazing uh, film that I just released. With the help, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm giving credit where credit's due to uh, Reads Across America. It would not have happened without Reads Across America. Uh, if y'all don't know, Reads Across America is the organization that puts uh, Reads on the headstones of uh, all, most all of the um, the headstones at Arlington, which is a big deal. And then they have actually branched out, and they're now helping uh, other veteran. Um, funeral homes and, and other organizations to put uh, wreaths on the headstones of, of other veteran, um, uh, I don't know why the word is, uh, cemeteries, I guess is the word I'm looking for, you know, so it, it's a big deal. And the premise to going to Vietnam, and, and that's what the, the documentary, where the documentary takes place is, is Vietnam, is uh, the chairman of the board for Reads Across America is a, very, a Vietnam veteran. Uh, the organization, veterans organization, Waypoint Vets, was doing a their first overseas tour where they were taking 10 Vietnam veterans back to the country for the first time since the war. Uh, they specialize in adventure therapy. I know I'm introducing everybody to a lot of new people here, but uh, Reads Across America uh, and then Waypoint Vets were instrumental in, in this, getting me over there. And I was all by myself. I was a one-man show following around the, the 10 Vietnam veterans, as well as the three, uh, four team members from Waypoint Vets. So uh, it, was, it was an adventure for me. It wasn't just a normal go-to-work day. It was definitely... Uh, you know, there were hard times that we had to meet, definitely had to have meet. So, so I had to juggle, uh, you know, filming all day long and then going back, charging batteries, taking, you know, dumping cards and getting ready for the next day and then laying down and trying to get a couple hours of sleep because I'm in Vietnam and I, I'm so excited. You know, I, I can't believe that I'm doing what I'm doing and uh, try to get a couple hours of sleep then to just get up and, and do it all the next day. And we were there for a solid six days. We left on the sixth day and it was, uh, we, we did the whole thing. We started in the South and, and uh, actually flew home from Hanoi, which was wild for the Vietnam veterans because Hanoi, when they were there was the lion's den. It, it was, it was not a safe place for Americans. Yeah. For sure. Back, back when Americans uh, were, in Vietnam doing what we were doing in Vietnam. Hanoi was a place you flew over and maybe left some explosive things behind, not a place you went to. No, no. And, and Jason, we were on an amazing cruise in, in Northern Vietnam. Uh, I, I mean, it was blown away. I was blown away. And, and so were the veterans too. And you can, you'll see it in the documentary. You'll hear them talk about how, you know, when they first got there, even though it had been 50 plus years, they still were looking over their shoulder. They were still worried that somebody was going to run up while we were stuck in a taxi and throw a hand grenade in the car because there was a, a, a car load of Americans. I mean, that was the stuff that they were dealing with mentally when they first got there, but it didn't last the whole time, I promise you. And you, you'll see that in the video. You know, that's that's fascinating to me. And and I do want to dig back into the film, but you were also deployed Middle East. I was as well. I was in Iraq. You were in both Iraq and Afghanistan, I believe, right? Uh, just Afghanistan. But just I, Afghanistan. I have, seven, I have seven combat deployments. In all yeah. Of them are um, do do yeah. you still have things like that, even all these years later? That even when you're back home, your your 
uh, not necessarily looking over your shoulder, but things you're cautious and wary about? Because I know I have oh. a couple of those. Oh, definitely. I, I mean, definitely here in the States, for sure. I do not like crowds. I, I go into a store. I know exactly what I want. I know where it's at. I go right to it. I get it, and I, I leave. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And and I'll, I'll go even further to say that if you, Jason, were to come to me and tell me that you're going to take me on this exotic vacation back to Bagram, Afghanistan, I wouldn't go. I'm, Pass. I'm, you know, maybe in 20 or 30 years, you know, after things, but I've only been out for five years, six years now. Like there's, I don't want to go back to Afghanistan for nothing. Not unless I'm going back to fight again. Honestly. Yeah. I, I can't imagine going back to Baghdad until about 20 or 30 years. I'd love to, if, if they, if, if things ever get better there, I'd love to go back and see it, but um, I'm not ready to do that yet. My thing is abandoned cars on the side of the road because we were, we were deployed in Baghdad. That was something we were always on the lookout for was an abandoned car that wasn't there yesterday on the side of the road. Cause there was a lot of vehicle based IEDs when I was, get, when I was in Iraq. Um, so, you know, I just, you brought that up that those guys, even 50 years later still had that. And I was curious if you had some of those, cause I know I do. So. For sure. I, I mean, we, we were put in situations that humans weren't, I believe, weren't designed to be put in. Uh, and we have seen things that humans were not designed to see. This is not normal. War, what happens at war is, is not normal. It's not every day. It's not every day life. One hundred percent. It is it, not normal is probably the best way to describe it. Not normal human activity. So, I do want to dig back into the film, but I do have a question. Um, the organization is called Waypoints America. Waypoint and Vets. Waypoint Vets. Waypoint Vets. I'll make sure we get that right for the show notes and get all their links and everything for people who want to check that out. But you said they do something called adventure therapy. Yeah, that's that's their – I don't know if it's trademarked or not, but that's definitely what they push. Uh, and the Vietnam trip, I think, was trip 2020, 22 or 23 – uh, right around there, their first international trip for sure. But they do, I want to say, four to six adventure a- adventures a year, where they take about ten veterans, maybe more, and they go and they pick a place and they go for an adventure. So uh, I know there's one that they were trying to get me to go to, canyoneering in Utah. I think that's in October. I know they are trying to climb uh, Mount Rainier. I know they were trying to get up Mount, Mount, Mount Rainier as well. Uh, they were trying to get me on that one for sure. That would be uh, – I, I trained a lot out in Washington. Mount Rainier would be would be fun. That would be adventurous. You better be in shape. You better hit that Stairmaster before you head up the – Absolutely. The mountain, oh <laughs> Absolutely. And the idea of adventure therapy is so interesting to me. What What are they trying to do with that? Is it is it just getting vets out to – uh, out and about and out of their kind of out of their heads. Tell me more about what the adventure therapy is about. And, and if you don't have a good answer for that, we'll get them on the show and we'll talk to them. No, I, and I, I want you to do that. But so I'm going to give you just the, the 10 cent tour. Uh, basically, we would go out and I am just speaking from experience because I've been on one of their adventures. We go out, we do fun stuff, lots of fun stuff, all day fun, eight, 12 hours worth of fun stuff. And then we come back, we get a bite to eat, and then we sit in a circle and we talk about something. We talk. We there's there was uh, there was a um, uh, a counselor, a, a, someone trained to handle one of these circles. I guess is the best way I can put it. And uh, and they they were talking about a different topic every day. Every day we would we would have a different different topic. And we stayed in that circle until everybody got a turn and, and everybody got something off their chest. And, and uh, oh, man, the emotion. Ah, Jason, I don't know. <laughs> well, just, I, just coming back to it, it makes me emotional because there was so much poured out on in those meetings. And uh, I don't know. It's nothing that I can fathom at, at 43 years old. It's not. It's not something that I can fathom at this point. I I think it's fantastic. Again, I don't know your experience. I know my experience. And I don't talk about my deployed experience. I was not an outside-the-wire combat kind of guy. But I don't talk about my deployed experience that much 
unless it's with people who were there with me. And I think it's important that that's a, we we should talk about this. So um, when we're when we're all done here, I want to get your con- the contact information for both of these organizations. Um, reach out to them, see if we can get somebody on the show talking about it. But also more importantly, here in Las Vegas, we have. Um, like I want to get them connected up with our vets and tech folks, and I want to get them connected up with, uh, we have merging vets and players, which is a very similar, but through sports kind of thing to what waypoint vets is trying to do. And, and I think it'd be great to get, to get some of what they're doing, uh, out here in Las Vegas. So how did you get connected up with wreaths across America and, uh, and, uh, waypoint vets to get involved in this project? And I, I, I don't have a fancy story for you for that. My, my father, uh, it is a pretty cool story. Okay. Um, my father is a truck driver by trade and he was selected back in 2012 or 2014 to drive one of the truckloads of wreaths from Maine all the way down to Arlington. And, uh, it took a whole week. They, they leave on like a Monday and they basically do a state a, a day pretty much is, is what it is. And you got a full police escort. Each state provides a police escort all the way down. And uh, my father, it, it, the way the timing lined up, it was just meant to be. Uh, I was just getting back from my second deployment, I think. I think it was second or third. And yeah, it was still, it was my second. And uh, he texted me and said, I, I texted him. I said, Hey, just landed. I'm back stateside. Woo. And he says, well, I'm, I'm in Connecticut right now, driving a semi full of wreaths. What are the chances that you can meet me somewhere? And I come pick you up at an airport and you finish this with me. Right. So Normally, when we got home, you probably know you get leave. You get leave after you uh, deployment, you know. But there's several days, sometimes weeks, that go by from when you get home to when you actually go on leave. Yeah. Uh, so I said, Dad, probably not going to happen. Like we still have weapons put away and, and a lot of stuff to do. Like I'm I'm going to be on leave soon, but it's probably going to be after all you're done with this. I just uh, because I love my dad and, and because I wanted to tell him and not lie to him, I went to the commander and I asked, and he said, yes, he said, yes. He says, you can only go up there and do, you know, the laying of the wreaths and stuff. So you, I was only going to be gone for a day, but yes, you can go. So by the time that happened, I was, you know, I had been on the ground 36 hours. My dad had already made it from Connecticut and he was in DC and it was the last day. So by the time I'm getting on an airplane in the morning, I'm flying, or no, it was the evening, I fly up to D.C. uh, out of Atlanta, and I get picked up by, uh, I have a police escort. My father picks me up with a cop, a couple of cops, and the whole Patriot Riders gang in their motorcycles, flags and lights flash and everything. So they bring me from the airport in D.C. to the gala that's already happening uh in dc washington dc and when, when i walked through the door the, it's like the record came off you know what i mean the, the scratch of the record thing like everyone turned around and it was announced that army ranger nick mott fresh off deployment just got here we'd just like to, to welcome him and and uh it, it was amazing it was crazy people just started bringing me food, plates of food and there was a line literally to shake my hand and thank me and hug me and, and stuff. And um, probably one of the coolest stories that came out of that was um, Chris Stonecipher was uh, the first American casualty. You know, I see you shaking your head. Chris Stonecipher was the first one. He was an Army Ranger. Uh, and he was uh, him and his uh, buddy. There was two of them that died at the same time, pretty much. That, that's what they think. But they were the first casualties of the war in Afghanistan. And his mother came up to me that night. She coined me, so I got a gold star coin. uh, And she uh, hugged me and thanked me and just said, look, I I can't get, I can't make myself go, you know, into the the cemetery tomorrow. Uh, No, correction, because Chris is not there. Chris is actually, uh, his, his remains are on the top of a mountain near where he grew up. He did that. I'm getting way off topic here. He did that because he didn't want his mother 
sitting by his gravestone all the time. He wanted it, 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 it put somewhere where it was out of place and they could just remember him for where he was and there wasn't remains to be sat over. So I thought that was a pretty cool story from his mother told me that. Yeah. Uh, don't uh, worry about getting off topic. I don't think these are stories that can get told too many times. We're, we're already getting a little distance from having left Afghanistan and Iraq. And I think it's important to keep talking about these things. So please keep telling your stories, especially about, about things like this. Also, most of our audience is kind of corporate startup, um, leadership kind of stuff, business kind of stuff. Can you explain for the audience what getting coined is? Okay. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Um, so I have actually researched it before. It goes back a long way to, to basically the start of people warring, uh, in, in the world. But, um, basically what it is, is, uh, is from my standpoint, because I was the commander's RTO. So I always had his coins when we would go uh, after a mission, after a crazy mission that went down, we would go out to wherever they were at and, and we would, the commander would, you know, give them an attaboy, give them a coin, shoot the breeze with them, maybe eat dinner with them or breakfast if we could, you know, stuff like that. So uh, being coined is the ultimate, man, it's the ultimate handshake. It, just to, to get a coin from a gold star mother to uh a crazy story, okay, if we're telling stories, I was at a bar after a de deployment, not not long uh, after my uh, third or fourth deployment, it was after Obama had come over and, and we had, uh, I was on the uh, mission to get Bergdahl, it was when we got Bergdahl, so I, we came back from that, and we were in a bar, and uh, so everybody, of course, the young privates pull out their coins, because everybody got coins while we were over there, one kid got a, a general, so one of the squad leaders pulls out a presidential coin because he was on uh, the, the detail with President Obama when President Obama came to, to borrow. And uh, so he put, he slaps his presidential coin on, on the table and he was like, there, take that, you know? So I pulled out my gold star coin and slapped that down and I didn't say anything. Everybody just got quiet. And they're like, what's that? What's gold star? Like, I, I don't understand that. And they're like, no, man, the presidential coin's way higher. You know, what? put that back in your pocket. And the first sergeant got up and he was like, Gentlemen, y'all need to hold on a minute, and I'm going to explain something to you. That mother that gave him that coin lost more than that president has ever done for this country. She has lost more than anybody anybody in, in the military. She has done more than any general. She's given more than any general. She's given more than anybody in this army. So absolutely, Sarmat, you win, you win the coin toss, so I have my beer paid for. But no, he was right. He was absolutely right because... Those gold star coins, those gold star moms that I see when I, I go on, because uh, they have a whole bus full of gold star family that go on the Reeves tour every year. And you want to talk about a heavy load on that bus. Yeah, for, for folks who aren't familiar with what a gold star family is, it's, right, uh, yeah. Yeah. it's a family who has lost a son or daughter or family member. Um, you know, on on duty for the military, whether that's active duty or reserve duty, or it's right. a it's yeah, mo it's matter. mostly combat losses, but um, yeah. they they carry a very heavy burden. Um, and um, again, I think uh, even even as we're starting to get some distance from the the conflicts we've been involved in, which feels really recent to you and me, I don't think we can talk about this stuff too much. I think it's I think it's something we all need to keep talking about. So, but I would like to shift gears a little bit. So tell us about your company. Tell us how you became a filmmaker. Okay. That's a fun one too. Um, so I got out in 2018. I signed out in January and locked myself away. I, I did sign up for college. I was doing online school and I had a couple of butt in seat type classes that I was going to because people were telling me I needed to get out more, but I didn't, I, I had no desire. I had no desire to be part of society. I had no desire for a job. I, I, I couldn't be an RTO to the commander anymore. I, I didn't know what I wanted. And so I locked myself away for a solid six months. It might have been eight months. And uh, I was just wasting time, just wasting time on social media, wasting time, uh, just wasting time is all I can tell you. And uh, I had commented on this photographer's post 
and uh, it was an off-road race. Um, and it's called rock bouncing, and basically it's hill climbing. They're in 1,000 horsepower machines with purpose-built chassis, cages wrapped around them, and they're on 40-plus-inch tires, and they climb hills that, that, that are hard to walk up, let alone drive a four-wheel vehicle up. So um, he was like, hey, man, you know, just, just come to a race. Just come to a race. You're not doing anything else because I, I had opened up to this young. He was a young kid too. He was barely 21 and and uh, just getting started in life. But he was an Eagle Scout and we had a lot in common. He was an old soul and uh, he got me to he he got me. I drove like 18 hours that first race and uh, I drove up there and we we shot the breeze in the uh, parking lot of a seedy hotel and and got a couple hours of sleep and then went to the race the next day and he explained me to me what i was going to expect and and i linked up with a couple other photographers and videographers and they gave me a camera and sent me up on the hill so i was right in the action so this was great because i i lost all of the adrenaline rushes from war and jumping out of airplanes and shooting guns and blowing stuff up every day i lost that and and now I have a thousand horsepower, five thousand pound machine barreling at me, and I'm looking at it through a three inch screen. Uh, it was the adrenaline that I needed. I needed it. I, I needed that again. So I got out. Uh, I left that race, and uh, I had met the president of the the race series while I was there, and just being me and nosy, and and uh, he was like, well, hey, we. We always need help if you're willing to, to come back and help. And I said, okay, uh, well, I really don't have anything going on. I, I, I'll do that. So um, at that time, we were in San Antonio. My better half is still active duty. Uh, uh, Claudia, I hope you get to watch this. I want to give you a huge shout out. I'm super proud of you. She is signing out of the military in June, 20 years. Uh, got her master's degree. She is just, just the epitome of what a soldier should should be. You know, oh, please congratulate Please congratulate her for all of us, because I know I know what it's like to sign out at 20 years, and it's a huge yep. accomplishment. Yep, I agree. Uh, mass, like I said, got her master's degree, paid for. She's getting out. Does doesn't have any education to get. Doesn't have any education debt. Uh, 20 years, two combat deployments, one to Iraq, one to Afghanistan. She's just a just a stud, man, and I am so proud of her. But anyway, um, she was stationed in San Antonio at the time. We moved to Arizona, so. I couldn't afford to fly every time. And there's a race every couple of weeks sometimes. So I was literally driving from Tucson, Arizona to the Southeastern United States every couple of weeks. Uh, and I put on over tw almost 26,000 miles that year, driving back and forth to races. Uh, I was committed. And just like in the Ranger Regiment, I, ha I had that laser focus and, and it was, scratching that itch so i was i was there i was going and uh i was a camera holder i was a announcer also because i knew the sport i knew the folks i knew the people very well and uh and finally i just started getting so much work because we we're i was getting people asking me to put together videos because i was just doing my own videos because I, what i was doing was cool so i was editing my own videos and so I started having people come to me and asking me to do their videos and help them create content for their race programs and their race pages and stuff like that for social media. So I, so I, I had so much work that I had to go legit. So uh, I, I started 7-5 Media, and, it, and it's not 7-5 as like the Ranger Regiment. 75th was the, the Ranger Regiment is, was the unit I was in. It's 7-5 written out, S-E-V-E-N. So uh, – I decided to, to name it after the unit that I was in and, and uh, the rest is history. And I tell you what, because uh, I, I know that you, you know, the, who's watching right now, all you corporate based folks and stuff like that. Like it is, it is a different world for me. And I'm smiling because like I, I can smile. I'm glad that I'm smiling. My dad would be so proud of me right now because like I was in a bad place. And now that I own my own business, it is revitalized. You know, I have, I jump out of bed in the morning now and rush around. My office is in my house, so I don't have to go far to work. But uh, I love what I do. And I run to my, my office space every day. And, and anytime I have to leave to go work, 
uh, it's not a pain in the butt. I love it. It's great. It's given me it, it's that same because when I would wake up in Afghanistan, I would put my uniform on. I'd stand in front of that mirror and I would say, you are not going to let the commander fail today. That was what I, I just that was how I got through that stuff. And and now that that's what I have now. I have that back now. I lost it. And now I have it back. And, and uh, it's just in the form of a, of a camera now instead of a radio. <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh... Uh, I know a lot of people don't understand this and I know a lot of veterans don't understand it because sometimes it, it's an adjustment for everyone coming off of active duty or coming off of whatever, you know, taking that uniform off is an adjustment for some, for some of us, it's a minor adjustment for others. It's a really major adjustment, but it's an adjustment for all of us. And again, something I think we don't talk about enough. So you're behind the camera. Now you used to be a radio operator. So I want to get into all that into your into your army service and and the question is going to be a bit long, but I want to I want to kind of lead the witness a little bit. So first, let's talk about why you put on the uniform in the first place, and then becoming a ranger, becoming a radio operator, and finally ending up as an RTO to a commander, and also explaining to us what an RTO is. Sure, good good questions. All right, so uh, my brother is about five years younger than I am, and he went in before I did. He was a, a body guy. We both grew up gearheads, uh, and he was working in a shop where they had made him some promises about taking over the business, and uh, it, it wasn't happening because he was in there making them a bunch of money, and it was hard for them to step away You know, now that they had somebody solid in there make, uh, getting the work done. So he went in, he actually went in and asked to be a Green Beret. He wanted an 18 series contract. And the recruiter said, well, I, I can't get you an 18 series contract, but I can get you a 40 series contract. And he was like, 40 series contract, what's that? And he says, Ranger, uh, special opera, it's a special operations quick reaction force, uh, small, very small unit, about 3,500 people total. Uh, and and the, at the time, there was only four battalions. But um, there were only two states that he could be in, and that was Georgia and Washington State. So that was huge for him because all of his family was on the East Coast, his wife's family as well. So he took, he took the four, option 40 contract. He had no idea what he was getting into. He, he really didn't know what the Ranger Regiment was. Uh, and he went, went through, and he was, he was doing very well. He ended up bro breaking his leg uh, in selection. And he ended up passing the five mile run in under 40 minutes with a broke leg. He collapsed at the finish line and they took him to the hospital. And uh, so hearing all of those stories, I'm like, man, my, my brother is a stud. And, you know, I was athletic growing up and, and so on. I played sports in school, but I was a I was a power lifter. And at the time I had already had you know at least a decade in, in the powerlifting. I won a state championship. And, you know, so I was active. I was in shape, I would say. But uh, 2008 rolled around and I went down and I saw him graduate airborne school. And I said, I said, man, this is pretty cool. And at the time, y'all probably remember 2008 was a rough, rough era. There was some, some serious issues with the budget and, and our, uh, the economy was really, really bad, and, and people were actually getting fired around me, all around managers. I was a manager, and, and all of the managers were getting fired around me, and they were bringing in people and paying them way less. So I knew what was going on, and when I talked to him about that, when I saw him graduate airborne school, he was like, hey, man, Uncle Sam is always hiring. So I went home. I didn't get fired. I, I was worried that I was going to come home to a pink slip. But I went home immediately. I put my house up for sale, and I left for basic training about six months later. And that was 2009, first the start of 2009. I, I was leaving for basic training at 28 years old. Uh, I didn't have an option 40 contract like Sean did, so I had to go through basic training. And I always made it known I'm coming in here to the Army to be an Army Ranger because I saw my brother graduate airborne school. My brother had already made it through selection and he had made it to the unit. So he kind of knew what it was. And he was like, man, don't go to any other unit. He's like, we get all the latest and greatest toys. Uh, don't go anywhere else. So I, I basic training day one, I'm Nick Mott, private Nick Mott, and I'm here to be an army ranger. And, and I got laughed at. I mean, I was, 
I was laughed at, at in basic training, AIT. I went to AIT in, uh, in Fort Gordon, Georgia. And uh, I, was, I was laughed at because I was running on the weekends. I was, I was working out when everybody else was slacking off. When, when everybody else was getting their passes and going off post and getting drunk and stuff, I was studying the Ranger, the Ranger Creed or studying Ranger history. I was in the gym. I was running. I was low crawling in the, I was just putting myself through the worst kind of pain because I knew that that's what I was going to be going to. So fast forward to the end of AIT. Uh, I was not able to successfully volunteer to go to RIP at the time. So that's, that means you go to airborne school first, and then you go to Ranger Selection, the Ranger Indoctrination Program. Uh, it was a four-week selection program. I did not get that. The orders that I got were to Fort Huachuca, Arizona. I know it. So I called my brother. My brother is in Ranger School. I get somebody in his company. They get in touch with the first sergeant. First sergeant gets in touch with the recruiter. And within 24 hours, Jason, I had orders to RASP, to RIP at the time, the Ranger Selection. So I get called out. It's like the last day of AIT. We're getting ready to go, leave AIT, right, and go. And everything that I had, Sergeant or Private Mott, was going to Arizona. Their paperwork all said Mott's going to Arizona. That's what they were tracking. And at the very last minute, my orders changed to go to airborne school. So I, the first sergeant came out in formation on the, on the last day, and he called me out. And he's like, I don't know who you know. I don't know who you pissed off. I don't know what is going on. But everybody on the eastern part, part of the United States is looking for you. And they all want you to go to airborne school. So get the f out of my school. And that was, that was how I, I left airborne school was I had my car there. I just got in my car and I drove to Fort, Gore, or Fort Benning at the time, Fort Benning. Uh, so I do airborne school. I do selection. And I tell you, it, it was uh, a test. Airborne school was definitely something that I had never experienced, never jumped out of an airplane before. Uh, I had never ran that much, uh, never done that many pull-ups before. So it was a great precursor to, to selection. So I get to the selection area. It's right around Christmas time. We're put on Christmas leave. We're given two weeks Christmas leave. And when I got back, they had changed the program from RIP four weeks to RAFT eight weeks. Now, <laughs> so I got to be the guinea pig for the first ever RAS class, which, I mean, it was, it was good. They, they had their shit together, but for the most part, it was a whole lot of, they didn't have anything for us to do. So <laughs> they would just smoke us. But I, I had to break it down to the younger guys who were like, man, we keep, you know, we keep pissing them off. We keep doing things to make them mad, man. I can't believe it. Like, no dude, just, just all you got to do is look at it. Like these are three a days. Like you are literally getting to work out three, three times a day. You are literally working out and eating and getting paid for it. What are you complaining about? <laughs> you are a paid out. You're a professional athlete at this point, right? So we get through selection. I make it through, make it to the company. Uh, I go through the RTO school and RTO stands for radio telephone operator. And basically, uh, and I'll kind of mix this in with being the commander's RTO is uh, communication is one of the number one things you got to have on the battlefield. If you are not putting troops where they need to be, then you are not winning the fight, bottom line. So the commander needs to have communication, whether he is on that battlefield or he's back at the jock. He needs to have communication. So the RTO's job as soon as we get off that bird, or as soon as we get on the ground, I'll say it that way, because sometimes we're jumping, uh, immediately establish communications. I carried a 117 Golf. It was a pretty big radio, not just your normal, you know, handheld radio. It was a radio carried in I, my back. 
I think that's something we need to emphasize again for the audience is this is not a walkie talkie. This is not a like satellite phone. This is not a headset kind of thing. This is a, a full backpack radio, right? Yes. hundred percent. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I get out. Uh, I have the dish in my hand. It's not a dish like you'd normally think of a satellite dish. It wasn't a dish. It was, uh, rods that, that were folded up and, uh, and it was an antenna, right? So I'd get out, and I was usually holding that to establish comms. As soon as I get comms, uh, commander's talking back with whoever's going on, whatever's going on in the jock, talking to his men on the ground. Uh, we, we, it was a satellite connection, so I could actually send back pictures of, of the high-value targets that we were going after. So we could get a... a Yes, that's him, or you know what I mean. We can identify or, or say no, that's not him. Type of situation. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, towards the end there, it was getting pretty, pretty advanced, pretty advanced. I was carrying around a tough book and and a camera, and and we would send send back pictures if, if we needed to. Or, uh, but always had great comms. Always had great communications. That that equipment was amazing. Um, I was. I was selected, uh, I, ha I have a uh, letter of recommendation that I hold near and dear to my heart uh, from Colonel Vanek, who was the first RTO that I had. Um, and he states in that, in that letter that we were, him and I, were the most deployed Rangers in the, in the two years that he was the, the commander. And we were doing more than deploying to Afghanistan as well. We were training. Uh, we went to Brussels, uh, we were in Turkey, we went to Tajikistan, um, you know, we, we traveled a lot, around a lot, in, uh, uh, Pakistan, we, we would travel around a lot, we did, so, so even though we may, were, were not on the ground, we were definitely still gone, <laughs> we, were, we were gone quite a bit, and uh, I, I was, I did so well that the commander actually ha changed the policy or, or just changed it around, figured it out how I could stay on for the first six months of the next commander that was coming in as well, Colonel Evans. And that was a big deal because usually the RTO was done even before the commander got swapped out. So, you know, an RTO was doing it for maybe a year or something because of burnout, obviously, but I had rewritten the policy for that position while I was there to say, why not put two men together, right? Two Rangers together, a, a communicator and the commander, put them together and they stay together all year long. If, if, if they're not working out in the beginning, then we make changes. But if they are getting along, then you got two people who need to be communicating well and need to be getting along because they're going to be around together so much. Uh, you know, we need to be putting them together in the very beginning and they work all the way through uh, to the very end. And, and it just needs to be a position that you are aware when you go in that you're going to be gone a lot. And, and I was selected over, you know, well, like I said, and he says it in his letter, it was, you know, one out of 3,500 because there was over 3000 Rangers in the regiment when I was selected. And, and uh, I've never known a non-communicator to hold that position, but, but I mean, anybody could be, I suppose. Yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of people, even even folks in the military who um, wear the uniform, underestimate the the position of trust that is for a commander. Um, it's kind of like having your operations officer, your second in command for that, you know, for for your RTO or for someone who fills that kind of position in another service or another another capacity that that is such a position of trust and a bond that you need to have. I think a lot of people, even in the military, underestimate it. So you got to be around some fairly significant decision makers doing some fairly high profile and very important missions over in Afghanistan and around the world. So what, what did you learn about leadership? What did you learn about building teams? What did, what did you learn? What did you absorb from these these colonels that you were working for and building that relationship of trust with during your time? Well, I'm gonna be biased on this one and say communication. If you are not communicating as a leader, you are not a good leader. 
I can I promise you that. Uh, I watched Colonel Vanek write letters to mothers who had lost their children decades ago. Every single ranger, every month, every day, if a ranger had died on that day, Colonel Vanek wrote a letter that day for to that family. And I had to mail those letters out. It didn't matter where we were either. It would be stateside or in Afghanistan. It didn't matter. He was writing a letter and they were getting mailed out. Um, so, so I guess with that, I'll, with the communication, I'll also say empathy because you need to be empathetic to the folks that you're working for, that you're working with, that you, that you're working, that are working underneath you, you know, uh, now I don't, I don't want to say you need to be soft now because I, I do believe that the United States, especially the world even nowadays is a hell of a lot softer than it used to be. All right, and, and I, I do agree that there is a whole lot of times where you're going to be like, well, I'm not trying to upset you, but can you stop showing up 10, 15 minutes late every day? Like, no, no, you are 15 minutes late. If you show up 15 minutes late tomorrow, you don't have a job here anymore, period. That's how it needs to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out, that there is a difference between empathy and being soft or letting standards slip. There were plenty of times when I was when I was a, an operations officer where I had to say to people, I feel for you, I understand why you are 15 minutes late. If you continue to be 15 minutes late, that's cool, we can still be friends, you just cannot wear an Air Force uniform anymore. Right, or why, why are you 15 minutes late? My daughter's been sick the last three days. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, okay, yep. all right. Uh, you know, how's she feeling now? Okay, she's on the mend. Okay, good. So you shouldn't be late tomorrow? Yep. Okay, perfect. You know, I got that. I got that. That that I understand. But, yep. yeah, no. I, I, any, unfortunately. Any, oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, unfortunately, a majority of, of the men, for sure, uh, uh, in the United States anyway, for that matter, are just just want to be influencers or you know, nobody wants to work anymore working the working in the in the encyclopedia is changing i don't know why it's unfortunate but it is and working now is like sitting at home doing stocks and trades for a couple of hours and then spending the rest of the time driving around in your mclaren uh you know what i mean it's it's tough to I just, I, I still have a lot of respect for those that are out there grinding. Uh, those are the folks that I, I want to help. Those are the folks that I want to be around. Those are the folks. And, and I'll, I'll say that too. Surround yourself with like-minded people. As far as leadership goes, if, if you're not, if, if I, I could not have been as successful as I was if I wasn't surrounded by the men that I was surrounded by. I was surrounded by division one football players who decided they, that football wasn't for them that they didn't want to go to the NFL. They wanted to go be an army ranger. Those were the kind of people that I was around. So that's, I, I give them more credit than I give myself credit because a lot of times I was just riding coattails. You know, I was just around the right people at the right time. Uh, that, that's outstanding. And we thank them for their service too, because they certainly gave up a lot to yes. go. You you know what the pay is like as a young enlisted person in the military. You know you know what the lifestyle is like. You give up a lot as a Division One athlete to go. So I mean, th thanks thanks to them for their service and and my hats off to them. I'm glad you brought up empathy because while you were over in Vietnam filming this documentary, it had to get pretty emotional at times. Oh. Both, both for the veterans who are part of this experience and you as well. So yeah, everybody, yeah. tell us about that experience. Tell us about the tone. Tell us about the emotions that were coming up, and and ideally I, that you captured as part of your documentary. You know, uh, I've been through quite a bit of stuff in my life already. Ranger selection, seven combat deployments. I, I've been beat down and had to get up again. And none of those men that were on that tour uh, were back that in Vietnam were any better than me. I, I, when I walk into a room, I'm the baddest one in there. And I, I believe that. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot that have done more than me. And I don't say that to put myself up on a pedestal because I am humble. 
I do want to emphasize that. I am a very humble guy. Well, and I'm going to emphasize well, I, you did you did seven combat tours? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Sir. <laughs> uh, so when I looked at those guys, there was nothing that they could do that I couldn't do, right? There's nothing that they did that I haven't done already, right? And, uh, you know, they spent a year, some of them, you know, a year over there. Well, I spent three years in Afghanistan total. You know, so when I saw them be empathetic to the Vietnamese, when I saw them be polite and be nice to them and thankful and grateful for serving us and and taking care of our hotel rooms or whatever, whatever it was, I thought to myself, dang, man, you know, I, I, I sit there and say, I would never go back to Afghanistan. I, I don't want to have anything to do with Afghanistan from, from here on the rest of my life. I say that. I say that. But I saw those men who were pretty badass. I'm not going to lie. I mean, you know, Vietnam veterans, they, they, they definitely fought a different war than I did. That's for sure. But if they're bad enough to be able to forgive their enemy, and I had to do that as a Christian overseas. I did. I when you know, when we were flying into... When we're flying to the X, I had to pray and forgive my enemies. I, I had to do that. I had to be big enough to, to be able to do that. Not hate them for what I what I had to go. What, you know, I wouldn't have to be flying out here right now if y'all would just stop messing around. But but I had to forgive them. Uh, and I saw these Vietnam veterans doing that overseas. And, and I thought, man, if I can do, if they can do that, I can too. You know, so... I still say it right now. I don't know if I can go back to Afghanistan, but give it, give it some time. Give it some time, and hopefully, the, the country, if the country ever turned around uh, and was was uh, welcoming to us, I'm not saying that they had to turn because Vietnam definitely has a lot of Western. It is Western friendly now. Okay, uh, when you go into a restroom, you know they're full size restrooms. You walk through a full size door. Your your ceilings are you know, usually eight to 12 feet tall, right? You're sitting on a normal toilet. <laughs> right? and, uh, and for folks who don't know, even in countries that you might think are a little more westernized or a little more modern, it's not always that way in the restrooms. Nope. Nope. Um, yeah. Um, well, I don't, I don't want you to feel like you need to be in any rush to go back to Afghanistan, but I love, I love the idea that someday maybe we'll all be able to go and experience it in a much more positive way. Yeah, and, and again, it was those veterans and watching them, Sarah Lee, even, the, the founder of, of Waypoint Vets, says that in the documentary. She's like, it, it helped me. It helped her to be able to forgive and, and move on from what happened where, in our war, you know? Yeah. So what other lessons did you take from your time in the army, both deployed and in garrison, what did what did you take from your army service to doing a a really intense on location film shoot for this documentary? Uh, well, I I would say that the army and everything that I went through in the army <clears throat> trained me to be able to do the kind of work the way that I do it. And, and I say that because there's a ton of videographers out there, cinematographers, videographers. Uh, it, it, we're in a digital age now. And, uh, it, you know, you can have a cell phone out there and do as much as that $10,000 cinema camera does. So uh, it's, it's a, a saturated market. And I pride myself on if, if you called me Right now, I could pretty much leave within a couple of hours. So, and and get there and do the job and not complain about it and not ha and you wouldn't have to babysit me or or any of that. I I can find my way to you, do the job with the information that you give me, and then fly back home and do you know edit and and deliver a product, and and that's it. I I know of other companies that do what I do that require a lot of 
you know, they've got to have that black SUV at their rental car, you know, and they carry, they all have all brand new cases, fancy cases that they carry their brand new cameras around in. And man, the, the computer that I edited that, that the computer that I edited, and I'm only, I'm, this is coming out on this show. The computer that I edited that documentary on was 12 years old, a computer. So I, I can do more with less, I guess, is one of the best experience or, you know, what I, what I took from the Army is being able to pretty much figure it out. Just whatever you need, I can pretty much figure it out for you. <laughs> yeah, we... We never, especially if you've been deployed in the military, we never, we never quite lose that ability to pack and go in a very quick period of time. It's, uh, I was surprised that I, a couple of weeks ago, I had to do something very similar to, it wasn't traveling, but it was getting somewhere across town and it was, it was very much, okay, I can do this. So, right. and, and you and, mentioned and the black might destroy is, somebody else's day that might wreck somebody else's day. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Right. So, and you mentioned the black SUV, you know, I always find that funny too, because for me, travel, I, I compare every travel situation to, is it better or worse than taking the C-130 into Iraq? And I have not found anything that was not, was not below taking the C-130 into Iraq yet. So I'm usually, uh, usually pretty, pretty comfortable no matter, you know, put me on the back of a moped to get me where I'm going. I'm okay. Uh, it's been an amazing year for you so far. What what else do you have coming up in 2024? Do you have other projects? Do you have goals for the company? What what's coming up for Nick Mott and 75 Media in 2024 and even 2025? We're almost halfway through the year now. Shoot, I know, it's crazy. Uh well, I'll just give you some of the, the projects that I'm the big projects that I'm working on right now that I'm excited about. Uh I'm doing three videos to help the American Legion get ready for their big uh expo in august and so uh that has been exciting because i really didn't know much about the american legion uh, i i really don't know much about any of those organizations to be honest with you those those veteran organizations that are uh, so so i'm very excited about that and and learning more about the american legion i definitely would like to learn more about them i i don't know that i'm a a join the American Legion kind of guy yet, but uh, give it some time. Um, one of the biggest projects and one that I'm most invested in right now is uh, the uh, doing a podcast with a fellow ranger, fellow veteran ranger called Operator Debrief. And uh, they, it's on YouTube. He said when he was a kid that he watched, grew up watching Rambo and Ninja movies and he wanted to be he wanted to be Rambo. He wanted to be a bodyguard. He was a bodyguard for several years after the military for several high value uh, clients. So he, he has he has started doing interviews and it is just blown up. He he'll do an interview or an interview will post and he'll get five or six messages or phone calls that day uh, for other rangers or special operators who are looking to come on and be interviewed. So we have some investors who are already sniffing around. Uh, so we're actually that uh, have a meeting tonight to discuss finances and, and stuff like that. And it, it might blow up. I mean, if it blows up so big that I've got to go full time, I will. I'll, I'll do it full time because uh, Eddie's mission is, you know, I don't, I don't know about your unit, but we were it was pushed on us so hard for quad professionalism. We, we left in the night and came home in the night. We never had any parades, no welcome homes, no nothing like that. Quiet professionalism, you know, we, we, were, we were only around rangers for the most part, so you didn't really talk about missions because your buddies were on the mission, so who, you know, whatever. You, you didn't do anything cooler than your buddy did, you know? So uh, it, it's gonna be an opportunity for rangers or special operators to come on and tell their story Obviously, we're not going to get into some stuff because a lot of the guys are still, you know, read on to some mm -hmm. missions, you know, but, um, but yeah, it's going to, I think it's going to be a great opportunity for veterans from the special operations community to go on there and tell their story. There's, there's really only one other 
channel on YouTube that I know that does specifically special operations stuff, the team room, uh, and they have quite a quite a following. They've got almost uh, over 150,000 followers, so uh, I'm pretty confident that we could get Eddie up pretty quick, and especially if we're going to stick to just trying to do just Rangers. Rangers and, and those that work with Rangers, too, because we, we've already done a couple of 160 SOAR guys as well. But you're talking, you know, uh, Somalia Rangers uh, and 160th guys. You're talking uh, all of the wars, all of them, and not just not just the major wars either, not not just Vietnam. I'm, I'm talking all the small skirmishes we're, we're going to be able to hear about, and, and uh, it's just super. I'm sitting there, and I'm – listening to these guys going, man, I wish I was on that mission. You know, I wish I was, I wish I was there when that all went down. And a lot of the times they were, they were, they, I was there, I was in the country. I just wasn't with them. I, but, I did some work with 160 SOAR um, back in ugh. my previous life. And so I'm familiar with what they do. I think they're a great addition to that podcast. I can't wait to add it to my playlist. I wish you guys all the best on that. Please let me know how I can be a service to help you blow that up. Um, and we'll get, We'll get that info from you and get that in the show notes so the audience can can check in on it as well. I think those are going to be some amazing stories, even without all the the really secret parts uh, in there. So what was one of the best mistakes you've made and what did you learn from it? Oh, probably the, the best mistake I, I ever made was locking myself away and realizing even though I was in a rough spot that I still was – very blessed uh, to one know the truth about Jesus Christ, but two have gone to war as many times as I did and come home. And really, uh, I uh, I don't know that you know there's, there's just so much to be thankful for just in that, just in all this stuff that surrounds me, this house that I live in, man. I, I mean, there's people, families in Afghanistan that will never have this their entire life. They'll live in huts and wood shacks. That's literally all it is. And they live for their religion. They live they live for their God and, and uh you know I, I have air air conditioning running right now. My dog's chilling next to me here and I'm talking on this massive computer that I have and I mean those are blessings to me. And and they can be taken away and go away. They can go away. People I, I we we sit around and and think that we're in America and we're safe and you know I hate to say it but all this stuff can go away real quick real quick I I I don't think most Americans can really understand what what the rest of the world is and uh, and, and it's great to go visit Western Europe it's great to go visit tourist sites until you've been somewhere like in Iraq or Afghanistan or other parts of the world like that. Um, it's really, I, I know I didn't understand before I deployed to Iraq what that really meant, but thank you for sharing what you're grateful for. Cause that was going to be my next question. We always ask that on the podcast. What advice would you give to future leaders, future entrepreneurs like you, young people who, especially about if they're looking to tell a powerful story, like, like your documentary. Know, know your craft, beat on your craft, beat it to death, be the best one in the room when you go and sit down. I was just talking about how there's tons of videographers and stuff in, in the world right now. It's just a saturated market. Uh, if, when somebody makes a post in, the, in a group nowadays, hey, I need a videographer, 40 people answer within eight seconds. I mean, it's, it's just so saturated. But... I can almost promise you that probably 90% of those people that answer are just doing it because they see videography as a cool job and they think it would be neat to do it for a living. They're not necessarily good at what they do. I hear a lot of that because I talk to a lot of clients who say, I had this person do it. I did, don't go to this, you know, this company's trash. This person, does, I need, I, what can you do for me? And they're coming to me last resort type of thing. So know your craft because if you are good at what you do, you won't have to look for work. It'll just come to you. 
And, and that's how the American Legion reached out to me. They saw the documentary, or they saw the preview. They didn't even see the documentary. The documentary hadn't even been released yet. They just saw the preview to the documentary and then went back and saw my work for the, in the off-road stuff and, and, and hit me up uh, and hired me on. So, you know, know, know your equipment, know your craft. And, and then all those things that I talked about before, you know, empathy and uh, just so, everything that I said before as well. You know, well communication. We communication. Are, yeah. We are big believers in honing your craft here, both on this podcast and with my company. Our craft here is helping people become the kind of leaders they always wish they had. And so the communication, the empathy, it all fits in. But um, I think you're the first person on this podcast to ever talk about honing your craft, really, really beating your craft down and, and getting a handle on yeah. it. And I, I Dude, love that. I, I am not, I have no education in, in cinematography. I have no education. The only education I have is out, out there and doing it, doing the damn thing. And, and that's it. I mean, I'll, that, that's it. I'll, that's all I can tell you. I, I saw something cool and I went after it. And if you don't have that in you, if you don't have that bone in you, then then just stick with the stock in the shelves at Walmart and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And be be good at that too. I'm not trying to put that down. Be the best at that. Find out what you want to do and be the best at it. That's it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So what else should we know about Nick Mott and Seven Five Media? I have two lovely children that I don't get to see as much as I would like. They live with their mom in Washington State. I love them very much, Ethan and Emerson. I'm so proud of you guys. Um, and Claudia, too. You know, my, my family is super important to me. My dad works full-time for Reads Across America now. Uh, he is the right-hand man to the, the, the uh, president of Reads Across America. Um, and, and my mom is retired down here in Florida, and she feeds every single – animal within probably a eight or 10 mile radius. So she's, she's doing what she loves. Awesome. Well, again, congratulations to your wife on her retirement career. Congratulations to your whole family. Thank you for your service. Tell us the name of the film. Cause I don't know if we talked about that. Tell us the name of the film and where everyone can find the film to watch and tell everyone where they can reach out to you. Uh, so 75 Media, I'll start with that. We are on all of the major platforms, so Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I'm not on, on X because I just don't really, uh, you know, I don't talk much, so I don't need to write down what my thoughts are. Um, the documentary is only on Reuse Across America's YouTube channel, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to, because they changed the, the actual name of it, but it's... Uh, if you search Reads Across America, it's, it's one of the first videos that will come up. And, um, but I do have it right here, and it is the Mission Veteran Expedition. That's what they ended up going with. Um, okay. that's, that's what uh, Waypoint Vets, Waypoint Vets is the, the group that uh, took us over there. Um, and that's their mission expedition is kind of their, their brand. Awesome. And we will, viewers, don't worry about it. We will find all of those links. I'll work with Nick. All of those links will be in the show notes. You don't, and you'll be able to click them and get right to it. You don't need to worry about finding those. Yeah. Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. I've been looking forward to doing this conversation. We talked a couple months ago, but I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you for a long time. And I know this was a long time coming as I got my own schedule stuff worked out. But thank you all for turning, tuning in. And if you like Nick, you want to see the documentary, please thank Nick for joining us today. Also, if you like what you saw here today, check out some of our other videos. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, do all the good stuff that, that helps with the social media and the audience and that kind of stuff. We love sharing these conversations with you. We're going to keep bringing them to you. So get out there today, make an impact, onward and upward.